Well, good morning. Good, morning. good to be with you guys way in the back. Good to be with you. Hey, if you hadn't been to church in a long time, I'm glad you're here. If this is your first Sunday, glad you're here. And for the rest of you that come on a reg regular basis, so glad to be with you today on Easter Sunday. So we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I got an Easter wish. My Easter wish is that you would know Jesus for all that he is. Now, let me tell you a story about how I came to faith in Jesus Christ and kind of the life that I lived just for a minute to get, get us going. Um, I had, I remember at a very early age, my mom and dad actually uh, would take me to church. My, my dad came to faith in Christ in Campus Crusade, Texas Aggie, uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ. I heard somebody in Aggie about to cheer over there. There you go. And then uh, my mom came, became a Christian, and then so our family became Christian. So I grew up in a, in a, in a Christian household. I remember uh, one Sunday, I was just a little kid, probably in the first or second grade, and uh, I was already, I, it's like I had a phobia to church just at a very young age. And so we go to the church service, and I'm sitting there, and the teacher says, uh, hey, why don't we all go around the room, get to know each other, and everybody shares what their wish is, what, what they wish, what do they want, what do they want to be when they grow up. So they're going around the room, I'm just a little kid. And so um, I'm sitting there, I'm already embarrassed to be at church, a little nervous, just a little kid. And one kid says, I want to be a doctor. And everybody's like, oh, great, Tommy, so glad you're going to be a doctor. And the little girl says, I want to be a nurse. Or, uh, and then everybody, oh, great, little Susie, so glad you want to be a nurse. That's cool. And then another kid says, I want to be a fireman. And I'm like, oh, man, that's cool. And then I, it's like I forgot that the circle was coming to me as this little kid. And it comes to me, and they say, Ryan, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I wish I could be a snake. <laughs> and then Sunday school teacher's like, that's a bad animal in the Bible. <laughs> From that point on, I felt like I didn't fit. I didn't belong to church. I felt like it was just, I was afraid to be put on the spot. So I go through this crazy cycle in my life. From the time I'm a little boy all the way till I'm 18 years old, kind of just trying out everything, kind of felt like the church didn't fit me. My mom and dad were Christians, but I wasn't. But if you were to ask me as a young man, are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus? I would have emphatically told you, yeah, I, I know Jesus. 18 years old, I'm uh, in the mountains of Colorado, I'm, I'm, uh, we go on this big expedition in the, in the beautiful mountains of Buena Vista, the Collegiate Peaks. I'm there all by myself one night. I've watched some of my friends commit suicide. I watched some girls uh, have abortions. Watched some of my friends go to jail. I did not do well in junior high and high school. I got in all sorts of trouble, and I tried to better myself and be different, but I was still empty. So I get to Colorado. It's the last thing. This is the last chance I was given God that summer in 1997. I said, Jesus, how come I don't know you? I go to church from time to time, at least Christmas and Easter. I, I, I even got baptized. Okay, so I did get baptized for a girl because the girl said I only date Christians. But I'm like, I've done a lot of good things. And the Lord spoke to me that night, and he said, Ryan, you've never known me. I thought that's got to be a psychological trick that my Sunday school teacher implanted into my brain. Uh, it's not true. That's just some weird guilt filling. I need to be positive here. So I ask again in my own way, Lord, how come I don't know you? And the Lord spoke to me very clearly and said, you never knew me. Then a Bible verse came to my mind, and I didn't memorize Bible. And a Bible verse came to my mind, and it said this. Ryan, whoever finds his life is going to lose it. Whoever loses his life, though, for my sake, that's the person that's going to find it. And I thought right then and there, here's my problem. I never have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ for all that he is. I was always in control. Like Carrie Underwood says, Jesus, take the wheel. My deal was I had the wheel. It was my life, my authority, my decisions. And so the reality was is that I realized I needed to to know Jesus better. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 16. He's a believer. He surrendered his life just like I did that night in Colorado in a radical way and said, you take full authority over my life. And guess what? 
he got to know him deeper and more and more and more as the years went on. He says this, I want to know Christ, Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection, the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. The Apostle Paul knew that the resurrection was a key and critical component to identifying and knowing Jesus. And he says, I want to know the power of your resurrection. And he says, I want to be resurrected too. Uh, We've got the hope as Christians that if we trust our lives to Jesus Christ, that when our body gets old, when our body starts to break down, there's a hope. We're going to get a new body one day. And some of you old people are like, amen. (laughs) You young people don't care about that. Don't worry, go ride a dirt bike, do a flip, you'll see what happens. So so the Apostle Paul says that he loves this idea that becoming more like Christ, and then he says, I've not already attained all this, but I've not already achieved my goal, but one thing I do, I'm going to press on. Here I am, I'm 40-something years old now, and each decade becomes different for me. But my season in my life and knowing Jesus changes. I know him better now, better than when I first did. And I'm going to press on. And the challenge for you today, whether you've been a Christian for a very long time or, or you're very new to the Christian faith, you've got to press on. Especially in a times like these, you've got to press on to know there's far more to, to Jesus and who he is than what we make him out to be. The Apostle Paul says that he presses on towards the goal and that all of us that are mature in our faith ought to take the same kind of view and that God's going to clear it up for you. My prayer is today, my Easter wish is that you know him, that you actually really know him. That's my Easter wish. This was the Apostle Paul's Easter wish, is that the church in Philippi would know Christ. That was his wish. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that you and I, we know Jesus, perhaps just one perspective, one view of who Jesus is, maybe two, maybe three, but I want to just highlight to you what I would say are very popular perceptions of who Jesus is. Um, One is, the first one is that people see Jesus often as this sweet little baby in a manger. Um, They think of Jesus out of Luke's gospel. They remember the Charlie Brown story when Linus gets up and answers the question what what, what Christmas is all about. And then Linus says, he says that there's, there's shepherds out in the field and they were keeping flock by night. And behold, The glory of the Lord shone around them, and the angel said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign for you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a, help me, manger. That's sweet little baby Jesus. That's that sweet little baby Jesus that we all love and we all like. And don't get me wrong, like I don't want to do a Christmas service if we don't have sweet little baby Jesus somewhere. You know? But what's the problem if your Jesus is just the sweet little baby Jesus? Here's the problem. Babies don't have any authority over people. Babies are innocent in the sense that they can't really do much. They're, little, they're vulnerable. They're, they can do nothing. So if Jesus is your sweet little baby Jesus in a manger, you've got, an, you've got, a, you've got a God who's, who's not powerful. You got a baby Jesus, and that's about it. There's no power in that. But he is so much more than a baby. Second uh, view I think that people have about Jesus is Jesus as the great teacher, that he was just a great teacher, that he offers advice, and that you know that we can learn from Jesus. I mean, he's got some pretty amazing statement: "Love your neighbor as your help me self." Turn the other. You got it. You've heard these teachings before. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're into Buddhism, Hinduism. It doesn't matter what religion you're in. Everybody would say Jesus is a great teacher. After I became a Christian, I I made an emotional decision. It wasn't intellectual to follow Jesus. Then I got shipwrecked in my faith thinking, what a dummy. I just gave my life to Jesus. The church, maybe it's just a crutch. Maybe this is wishful thinking. So then I started to investigate and actually had a Jewish professor tutor me in world religion. 
The Jewish professor at the university was not a messianic Jew. He didn't believe in Jesus. He taught that Jesus was a great teacher. But you know, after the end of the study of studying all these world religions with Dr. Ember as my professor, I came out with absolute confidence and wrote a paper called The Resurrection of Jesus Changes Everything. He was the only one, the great teacher, that claimed to be God, invited people to worship him, who does that, then he's crucified, he predicted his death, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies that had been written hundreds and some thousands of years before that actually took place, gets crucified, then he raises again. So nobody else did that. So I said, you know what? I'm moving from an emotional decision to follow Jesus Christ to an intellectual. He is far more than a great teacher. The problem if Jesus is your great teacher, you can walk out on the class anytime you don't like what you hear. If he's your great teacher, then so is Buddha. So is Gandhi. So is Muhammad. They're great teachers. No, 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 no. Jesus is far more than a great teacher. So what is Jesus well, he's also a miracle worker. And some of you identify with that. You're like, yes, Lord's performed miracles in my life. And you love a miracle worker. And all throughout the Bible, there's stories when the apostle uh, uh, Peter, his, his mother-in-law is sick, and he goes to Jesus, and he says, I want you to heal her. He, Jesus grabs her by the hand, picks her up. She's alive and doing fine. And then all of a sudden, word gets out in the community. Hey, this guy, Jesus, is healing people. He's doing all sorts of miracles. A crowd starts to gather. People start to come together. Jesus is healing everybody, doing all sorts of miracles. We know Jesus did a lot of miracles. That's why he's so powerful, so influential. Nobody's really like Jesus. But then, you know what's wrong about if Jesus is just your miracle worker? You get mad when he doesn't heal. You get mad when 911 didn't respond fast enough. God is far more than a 911 call. So what does Jesus do? I mean, the Bible shows us that Jesus didn't heal everybody. In fact, in Mark's gospel, later, after he had healed a bunch of people, he leaves, he's exhausted, spiritually spent, and he goes and he hides. And he's praying to his heavenly father. And then Peter shows up like, what are you doing? There's, there's a lot of people looking for you. Why don't you heal them? And he turns around and says, you know what? We got work in other towns. I need to go preach. He leaves people without healing them. See, you and I, if we put Jesus in the category, he's just a miracle worker, we got a short view of God. And when he doesn't answer your prayer, you get mad. Haven't you seen it before? I prayed my mom would be healed of cancer. She wasn't healed. I prayed for my uncle to be healed. He wasn't healed. God must not love me. Here's the problem. If you believe that Jesus is just some great miracle worker, you've short-sighted. You don't see the totality of who Jesus is. So here's my question today, again, is do you know him? Some of you um, know him as the baby in a manger. Some of you know him as the great teacher. Some of you know him as the miracle worker. But if you, if you settle Jesus for just some miracle worker, then you're going to suffer from what I call spiritual delusionment. You're going to be disillusioned, disenfranchised, disappointed, discouraged, and depressed. Because he's far more than that. Can he heal? Yeah, he can. Did he heal? Yeah, he did. Did he heal everybody? No, he didn't. In fact, you know, when Jesus was doing those miracles, he used them as teaching points oftentimes. When he multiplied the bread and the fish, then he turned around and taught, and he says, I am the bread of life. Miracles oftentimes authenticated who he was. Jesus is far more than just a 911 fix-it person for us. Do you know him? Maybe you know him as a moral example. My Jewish friends, um, they oftentimes, I ask them, what do they think about Jesus? And they say, he's a good moral example. He willingly laid down his life for his friends. He forgave. He turned the other cheek. Jesus is a moral example. Is that true? Yeah. He's a great example. But he's far more than a moral example. We, we can't treat him like he's just the good Mr. Rogers. The, the Mr. Miyagi who's got the special insight that we need to listen to. He's far more than that. What else? How do people see Jesus? I think they see him as the suffering Savior. 
Oftentimes, in many places of worship and churches, you'll see Jesus as the suffering Savior. You'll go and you'll see a cross, and, and on that cross is a crucifix of Jesus on that cross. Then you go to other churches and you just see crosses, but no Jesus on the cross. Then you go to other churches, there's no crosses at all. It's just a steeple. So back to that Jesus on the cross, and many believers look at that and say they, they identify so strongly with Jesus is on the cross. What's going on behind that idea? It's this attachment that Jesus is on the cross perpetually atoning for our sins as long as we participate in Christian activities. And the problem with that is that we get scared to death whether we really have the assurance of salvation because what if we miss a church service? What if we miss an opportunity to take communion? What if we miss the opportunity to confess our sins? And if we see Jesus is still on the cross, that one event wasn't enough. And then we live in guilt and shame. And if somebody were to ask you if this is your Jesus, then you say, uh, if they were to ask you, are you going to die? If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Many of the folks that believe this is so important. They just only identify as a suffering Savior. They'll say, well, I'm not sure if I've done enough good works. I don't know. I wasn't baptized correctly. Or I, I, I didn't do communion very clearly. Or I didn't confess enough. Jesus suffered on the cross. He did. And, but he's far more than that. He did far more than that. The apostle Peter tried to clarify that it's that one sacrifice was enough for all sins for all times. The apostle Peter said Christ suffered once for sins, one time. For the righteous, the righteous Jesus gave his life to the unrighteous that we might be brought to God. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive in the spirit. Jesus is more, more than a suffering savior. Uh, we look at Good Friday and we remember the cross. Last night, my wife and I watched The Passion of the Christ. It's a gut-wrenching movie. It reminds you of the sacrifice that was made, that we have forgiveness of sins. That cross right there should remind you that Jesus forgives us, that Jesus will meet us in the middle of our ground zero. When we're at our worst, oh, Jesus suffered and died. He knows your pain. He can forgive you. He can heal you. Yes, he can cancel your spiritual debt. But guess what else about Jesus? He's the resurrected Jesus. And his resurrection is a guarantee that you, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the Bible says, lives in you. He's the resurrected Jesus. This is what the apostles got amped up about. That that power that lives in Christ, the Bible says, lives in us. So is there a problem with thinking of Jesus as just the resurrected Jesus and just wanting to celebrate Easter and take down the cross, take down the crucifix, just do a steeple? Because we don't want to be negative. There can be a problem if you just identify with Jesus or just view Jesus as this resurrected Jesus. Here, here can be the problem. Tell me if you've been to these kinds of churches. We're not talking about sin. We're not talking about the cross. We don't use the word repentance. We don't like the word confession. We like, the, we like no crosses. We'll do a steeple. My point in saying, is there truth in that Jesus is resurrected? Is there truth that we should be hyper positive? That the power of Christ lives in you and me? Oh, yeah, we should be positive, man. We should be incredibly optimistic that... Our body, though it breaks down, we got a promise because of the resurrection. We're going to be resurrected too. We're going to get new bodies. We're going to be restored in this world. I mean, Jesus' resurrection, it really changes everything. The apostle Paul said that if Christ didn't day, uh, rise from the dead, all the preaching's just in vain. It is important. But let me tell you something. If Jesus is just your resurrected Jesus and you bypass the cross... And you bypass the great teacher, you're falling short. And you tend to jump into the camp of the hyper-optimist that doesn't want to talk about sin, that doesn't want to talk about confession, doesn't want to talk about repentance. You don't, and a cross is offensive. The cross is a reminder, but so is the empty tomb. So is the empty tomb. That's what separates Jesus from everybody else. He claimed to be God. He invited people to worship him. 
And then he rose from the dead after he was crucified on the third day, just as was predicted. That's what changes everything. Today in American culture, there's a a negative news, a negative narrative that is going out that says Christianity is dying. That's not true. Christianity is growing. It may change a little bit from online to on-site, but together the church is growing in leaps and bounds right now in America. Jesus is at work. Why is that? Because people know nobody else is like Jesus. He's risen from the dead. He's alive. In 2025, a Pew Research and Gallup Research are saying that Christianity is still going to be the largest religion in all the world. The church is alive and, and thriving. Why? Because Jesus is alive. That's why. Do you know him? I think this is perhaps the the most important view to hold to for Jesus, for you. Here's my Easter wish. That you would know him not only as the baby in the manger, not only as the great teacher, not only as the miracle worker, not only as the moral example, not only as the suffering savior, not only as the resurrected Jesus, but I pray, here's my prayer. That you know Jesus as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the King of glory. You can celebrate Jesus for a moment. In a time like this, when we see the frictions and the frustration within our own government system, let me tell you something, friends. We've got a king. He's coming back. He's promised to rule and to reign. When the prophet Isaiah said, and the government shall be on his shoulders, he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Isaiah saw far more than a baby in a manger. He saw a powerful, mighty king who will ride in on a white horse and with thunder on his thigh say, King of Kings. Even in the crucifixion, when the Romans crucified Jesus, they put king of the Jews. So I tell you today, I don't know exactly how you see Jesus, but I know that you need to know him. And the apostle Paul, as mature as he was, he said, I'm going to press on. I want to know all of him and his life, his death, and all of it. I want to know him. You and me, we need to be reminded that Jesus is king The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi trying to motivate the Philippians to see that he is a king worthy of worship from all times and all generations. No other name is going to be as high as Jesus' name. He said this to them. He talked about the incarnation, that Jesus would come, humble himself, and become man, and then take the form of a servant and die on a cross, and then be resurrected and exalted, and at the name of Jesus that Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, here's the problem with so much of Christianity. We want Jesus as the moral teacher because we need a better life. We want Jesus to be the miracle worker because our life's screwed up and there's a train wreck coming or you're already in it. But we forget that he's calling us to submit to him because he's the king. Carrie Underwood had that famous song, Jesus, Take the Wheel. That's a great word picture. Jesus needs to be driving your life. Do you drive your own life? Are you in control? Your whole destiny, is it you that that determines all of your destiny? Or could it be that you could surrender and say, Jesus, I'll take shotgun. You drive. My life, your hands. You direct me. You determined me. I'll be your servant. I won't try to be king anymore. See, when you get to that point, that's the point that you find salvation. How can we have a savior if we don't need saving? To me, that makes no good sense. If we need a savior, then we're self-confessing that we need to be saved. The truth be known is that, Yeah, you can take the wheel of your own life and drive it however you want to, but I'll warn you, friends, it's going to be a bumpy road. It's going to be real hard. And you'll be uncertain along the whole way whether really God is even with you. See, sometimes I think what we do is we invite God to just sit shotgun. Or we say, worse, get in the back of the truck. And then we drive. 
And we do it ourselves. And Jesus wants to tap your shoulder tonight, today and just tell you, hey, I'm taking the wheel. If I'm the king, I determine where we go. So here's your options. If you're willing to accept Jesus for all that he is, all of it, then you've got to see yourself as just saying, I'm going to submit to him. I'm going to take that step of faith, and I'm going to just going to submit. Submission is not uh, glorious all the time. It's actually very humbling. When you say, I want to do my marriage according to your terms, God. I want to deal with my business according to your terms, God, and your word. I want to live my life in moral purity according to your word, God. I want to do dating according to your word, God. I'm not going to try to drive everything in my life. I want it to be a reflection of what you want me to do. Prayers become like this. God, I don't know what turn to take right now, but I need you to take over. Submission is the key to salvation. It's you just saying, I'm going to receive this by God's grace. Through faith, you take control. Your ways are better than my ways. See, I had a lot of friends that would have said, Ryan, you're a Christian. And then I would tell them, then why do I have this deep emptiness inside of me? Oh, well, that's because you're on drugs. And if you got off drugs, you'd be better. So I got off drugs. I still felt empty. Oh, but if you performed better academically, you'd do, you, you'll feel better about yourself. I felt empty. Every little mountaintop was isolation and frustration. But when I came to this point, I said, you take control. I'll submit to you. You're the king. I'm not. And let me tell you something, friends. It's exhausting trying to be king. You were never wired for that. You were never made for that. You are made by God. You're loved by God, and he's got a special assignment for you. But you'll never know that special assignment and how you're going to function and do life until you submit. You don't get into the room to the king's council. You can't hear his voice. You can't feel his presence if you don't submit. You want to go to heaven? You want to have salvation? You want to have the life abundantly? There's, this is no joke. You don't submit, you'll never know him. He's the king of glory. His government, his rule will have no end. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for all my friends. The old prayer, our Father, you're in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Would your kingdom come, Lord? Would your will be done? On earth, on, as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, maybe you prayed that prayer in a whole new way today. That you said, I want you to be the king. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. The Bible says that if we simply just turn from our sin and turn towards our Savior, we can find forgiveness. The Bible says that if we simply confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. Another day shouldn't pass where you're in question. Another day shouldn't go on where you're like, I didn't just quite get it enough. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Christianity takes faith. It takes us taking that step. Some of you can make that emotional decision right now and say, I'm following Jesus. My life's a wreck. I feel the emptiness. I feel the void. Some of you are going to say, I can't do it just yet. I need intellectual reasoning to come to that conclusion. Here's my invitation. Do it. Exhaust your energies because if heaven is real, if hell is real, you have no time to waste. You, you should really think about this. If there is an eternity, and one day I believe that we will see this kingdom come, his will be done when Jesus, our king, comes back. But let me tell you something. We've all had a brush of death or the fear of death over this last year. And the worst thing that we could do on our first Easter out of this pandemic is to downplay who Jesus is. 
He's your king, ladies and gentlemen. He's your king. He's your king. Amen.